This is the Negev. It covers 60% of the land of Israel. It gets less than 100 millimeters of rain a year. The soil is salty. The sun is relentless. By every logical metric, this is a place where nothing should grow. And yet, look at this. You are looking at one of the most productive agricultural engines on Earth. In the middle of this wasteland, farmers are growing cherry tomatoes, peppers, melons, and even wine grapes. It is a statistical impossibility. A country that is more than half desert doesn't just feed itself, it feeds the world. Israel is a superpower of agriculture, exporting billions of dollars in technology and produce every year. How? How do you grow food without soil? How do you water crops without rain? And how did a tiny nation, fighting for its survival, invent a technology that might just save the rest of us from climate change? Welcome back to Grand Structures. Today, we are not looking at a skyscraper or a bridge. We are looking at a machine made of water, genetics, and silicon. This is the story of how Israel turned dust into gold. To understand the technology, you first have to understand the desperation. In the 1940s and 50s, the new state of Israel faced an existential crisis. Millions of refugees were arriving, but the land couldn't feed them. The Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, famously said, we must conquer the desert or the desert will conquer us. But they had a problem. The standard way of farming, flooding fields with water, was impossible here. Water was too scarce. They needed a miracle. And that miracle came from a man named Simcha Blas. The legend goes that in the 1930s, Blas was visiting a friend. He noticed a row of trees. All of them were small and dry, except for one. One tree was huge, green and thriving. Why? Blast dug around the roots and found the answer. A tiny, broken water pipe was leaking. It wasn't spraying water, it was dripping. Blas realized something profound. When you spray water in the air, 30% of it evaporates before it hits the ground. But if you drip it directly onto the root, you lose nothing. It was the birth of micro-irrigation. In 1965, Blas teamed up with Kibbutz Hatsarim in the Negev to form a company called Netafim. They invented the modern plastic dripper. It looks simple, a plastic tube with holes, but inside each hole is a labyrinth, a zigzag path that slows the water pressure down, ensuring that whether the plant is at the top of a hill or the bottom, it gets the exact same amount of water. This plastic tube was the first grand structure of Israeli agriculture. It allowed them to grow 50% more food with 40% less water. Drip irrigation saved water, but in a country with almost no rain, saving water wasn't enough. They needed more water. So Israel decided to do something that makes many people uncomfortable. They decided to drink from the toilet. Well, almost. Israel recycles its water better than any nation on earth. The numbers are staggering. Spain, a leader in recycling, reuses about 12% of its wastewater. The United States, less than 4%. Israel reuses 90%. This is the Shaftan. It is a massive infrastructure complex south of Tel Aviv. Every time someone flushes a toilet or takes a shower in the city, the water flows here. It is treated, filtered, and then, crucially, pumped into the sand dunes to filter naturally for a year. When it comes back out, it is crystal clear. But they don't pump it back to the taps. They pump it to the desert. Look closely at the fields in the Negev. You will see purple pipes. This is the international color code for recycled water. The lush vegetables you see in the desert are literally fueled by the city. It is a closed loop. The city feeds the farm, and the farm feeds the city. It is a grand structure of circular economy that has made Israel effectively water independent. So you have the water, but you still have the soil. The Negev soil is salty. 
Most plants die instantly if you plant them here. So Israeli scientists had to do one of two things, fix the soil or fix the plant. They chose the plant. At the Volcani Center and Ben Gurion University, scientists began breeding crops specifically to survive torture. They took tomatoes, peppers, and melons and exposed them to harsh heat and salty water. And they discovered a happy accident. When you stress a tomato plant with salty water, the plant thinks it's dying. In a last-ditch effort to reproduce, it pumps all its sugar into its fruit. The result? The famous cherry tomato. While the invention of the cherry tomato is a complex history shared by many, Israeli scientists perfected the commercial, sweet, long-shelf-life varieties we eat today. The desert tomato is sweeter than a regular tomato because of the salt. They turned a bug into a feature. Today, they are pushing this even further. They are growing olive trees and jojoba plants using brackish water, ancient salty water found deep underground that no one else can use. They have unlocked a second ocean of water beneath the sand. But the revolution didn't stop in the 20th century. Today, the Israeli farmer is as much a data scientist as an agriculturalist. This is the era of precision agriculture. Companies like Supplant and Taranis have turned the field into a motherboard. They don't just water the field, they water the plant. They wrap sensors around the stem of a plant. These sensors measure the tiny micro-contractions of the stem. They know in real time if the plant is thirsty. The plant effectively texts the farmer or the automated irrigation system to ask for a drink. The system gives it exactly what it needs, down to the milliliter and not a drop more. They have even developed root zone temperature control. In the scorching summer, the air temperature might be 110 degrees, but if you keep the roots cool using buried pipes with cold water, the plant thinks it is winter. It keeps growing. They can trick nature into producing crops year-round. And above the ground? Drones with multi-spectral cameras fly over the fields, spotting a single yellow leaf or a pest infestation before the human eye can see it. An AI analyzes the image and sends a robotic sprayer to treat just that one plant, reducing chemical use by 90%. This technology is no longer just for Israel. It has become the country's most valuable diplomatic tool. In India, there are 30 centers of excellence, where Israeli experts teach farmers how to double their yields. In Africa, Israeli drip irrigation kits are allowing villages to grow food during droughts. As the world gets hotter and drier, as California and Spain face their own water crises, they are all looking to the Negev for answers. The grand structure here isn't just a way to feed Israel, it is a blueprint for how humanity might survive on a warming planet. Israel's agricultural miracle wasn't built because it was easy. It was built because it was impossible. It was built because they had no choice. They took a land of dust and salt, and through sheer engineering force, they turned it into a garden. They proved that with enough innovation, there is no such thing as bad land. There is only land that hasn't been solved yet. What do you think? Can this technology save the world's food supply, or is it too expensive for the places that need it most? Let me know in the comments below. And if you want to see another example of Israel manipulating nature, check out our video on the $20 billion plan to dig a seaport in the desert. It's another battle against the sand. I'll see you there.